Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarman Sarkeesian. So I am the chair of the mentorship and membership committee on the Armenian Medical Society. Um, as we've seen in a couple of other videos, we launched a video series very recently to help highlight you know, some of the rising stars in our community and to help bring um, a lot of awareness to some of the challenges that a lot of pre-health students face. So we have a really nice lineup of students and we've had the, you know, really the luxury and the privilege to be able to interview them through their journey. As mentioned before, we're covering a wide spectrum of um, students across their journey. Some of them are still wrapping up their undergraduate degree. Some have just taken standardized tests. Others have matriculated into professional school and some of them will be in residency or fellowship program. Um, so today I'm lucky enough to have uh, Christian Daryl Hazarian here. Uh, Chris, tell us a little bit about your background before we sort of jump into your journey so other undergraduates and um, students can learn from you. Of course. Hi. Um, I am, my, my name is Christian Daryl Hazarian. Um, I'm an Armenian born in Pasadena. I'm 22 years old and I just graduated from UC Davis with a bachelor's in biology. Um, I pursued biology for many reasons beyond just m m uh, meeting the prerequisites for medical school because a lot of the courses in my major ended up being prereqs for uh, for, for uh, applying. And so I am very excited to um, take this gap year that I'm currently doing to strengthen my application and um, I've been just also doing things outside of the application. I've been um, kind of exploring a lot of different sports that I uh, started to like in, at, at UC Davis and things of that nature. Okay, very good. So let's tr uh, go back a few years. So you, when you and I first met, you told me about how you transferred to UC Davis from a community college. Tell me a little bit about that. What was your community college experience like and what was it like to transfer? Sure. So... I first went to Pasadena City College in 2019. This is pre-COVID, of course. And the landscape was different. When I got there, um, I was originally a chemistry major as well. I want to note that first. So I came in as a chemistry major at PCC because that was the um, class that I enjoyed the most in high school. And so I thought, if this is the class I enjoy the most, let's make a major out of it. And let's do that. When I got to PCC... Um, I began to consider uh, being a pre-medical student. And after my first semester, I think that's kind of when I made the decision that that's the career path I want to gear towards. PCC was great. I enjoyed my first semester. And then my second semester during spring, uh, the pandemic happened and everything went remote. After my second semester, I changed my major to biology, and that is when um, I basically decided to uh, pursue this different major for many reasons, but primarily because uh, the major itself encompassed a lot more of these, like, so the chemistry major did not have any biology courses, but the biology major had both the required chemistry courses and some biology, so um, I, yes, I was at PCC for three years total because when I changed my major, it added a lot of prerequisite courses and I had to take one extra year to take those courses and then complete the transfer requirements from PCC. Yeah, very interesting. You bring up an uh, interesting fact because I was also a chemistry major and I actually started as a history major um, at Valley College. So switching over was actually a tremendous amount of work. So you know, as, as you were aware, you know, you had to take an entire, you know, year and a half of calculus and then, you know, like linear algebra, differential equations, you know, calculus-based physics, OCHEM, general, biochem, plus all your, you know, you know, general head classes. So, so, so going back to your journey, um, so tell me, what was it like dealing with, you know, the community college classes versus um, some of the um, college level classes, university level classes? Did you feel like you were adequately prepared? Uh, adequately prepared for UC Davis courses? Yes. Um, I do. I feel like 
people sometimes tend to water down the difficulty of community college courses. They are very difficult. The content is rigorous. And I truly enjoyed having a small classroom size. I think that's the one thing that I really missed when I transferred to UC Davis. Having a classroom, even a biology course, where you have 24 to 30 students total, you have a lot more time to um, discuss any questions you have with your professor, any concerns. And so my experience at, at PCC was, was great. I do feel like I was adequately prepared. The professors truly do show compa compassion towards you, and they really go the extra mile because you have this um, time where you get to spend uh, to um, kind of meet with them, and they get to know you a lot better. So, uh, yes. So, um, you know, I remember when you and I spoke, we were chatting a bit about your grades and, you know, you did exceptionally well, you know, you did, you know, you were just shy of a 4.0. Not a lot of people can claim that. So how did you maintain those grades, you know, one at PCC and second, when you got to Davis, you know, it takes quite a bit of planning and strategizing good study skills. And so you want to highlight some of that? Of course, the first thing I did was when I got to PCC, I decided that I'm going to have each semester have roughly two STEM courses and one non-science course. So I didn't, I never overloaded my schedule with too many courses. So for, I'll give you, for, for example, I never took physics, biology, and chemistry in one semester or quarter. I felt like that was too much. I would do maybe biology, chemistry, and then a history course which would um, be a lot less uh, on the workload and allow me to focus more on those other uh, STEM courses. So that was one thing that I did. I created this four year template, uh, which allowed me to map things out, you know, and be concise with it. And then another thing that I really did was I went to tutoring a lot at specifically at Pasadena city college, they had free one-on-one -on -one tutoring in even courses like physics. So I remember signing up a lot for those tutoring sessions and I would dive deeper into the content. Uh, the professors were very accessible um, at Pasadena City College. And so when I went to Davis, I did miss the one-on-one -on -one tutoring per se. In Davis specifically, they have um, open tutoring where you sit at a table, there are multiple tutors and you kind of raise your hand. So it was definitely a lot less one-on-one -on -one time with the tutors, but over there, I experienced a lot more group work. So given that there are more students in Davis in the classes, I was able to form a lot uh, of study groups better. And I think that is what really played a vital uh, a role in maintaining my GPA post-transferring. So maintaining a high GPA when I got to UC Davis was I created a lot more study groups. I had a lot more colleagues. Um, and yeah, so that is those two reasons uh, I can attribute to maintaining such high grades. So and I think one thing for um, a lot of pre-health students who are transferring to keep in mind is that when you're applying to professional school, it doesn't matter if it's pharmacy, dental, medical school. If you're transferring from a community college, they do want to make sure you maintain your GPA. They do not like to see drops. So I think it's important for people to realize that the environment is going to change. Class sizes might change. The you know Your peers might have different ways of studying. The material is tested differently. So the best thing you can do is not only get an amazing foundation, um, especially at a community college, as Chris mentioned, the class sizes are smaller. Pasadena College is probably one of the best colleges in California, perhaps even in the entire country. And, you know, Pasadena is a pretty well-off area. So I think it's a very well-funded school that it had that reputation. You know, when I was going to school, I didn't go there in particular. But, you know, all these resources that Chris mentioned, I mean, one-on-one -on -one tutoring is exceptionally rare. At my school, we had a math lab. You know, you'd have to kind of raise your hand to get help, but it was definitely not a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so I think having any of these tutoring labs available. Um, you know what? I mean, all the power to you. I mean, why not take advantage of a free sort free resource? So 
Um, other than that, it looks like you, you know, you transitioned pretty quickly and you did very well. Um, other than that, I mean, you mentioned briefly that, you know, you ended up um, really enjoying your major. Do you think that's important, really loving what you're doing to make sure you maintain your strong grades? Of course. In, in order to, I believe, to exceptionally, to, to perform exceptionally well in these courses, you have to enjoy the content. You cannot force yourself to study. That's what uh, I believe some students that didn't perform as well, my friends that from uh, both universities, they didn't do so well because they're not enjoying the material. They're sitting there and they're forcing themselves to study. I actually enjoyed the content in both bio, chem, all the physics courses. So I would love to sit there for hours and go over the same topics over and over again. And this repetition kind of allowed me to uh, better understand it when exams would come up, when tricky exam questions would come up. So you definitely can't just pick a major for the prereqs for whatever school or th something you pursue post-graduation. It, it needs to be something you love because I want to emphasize that you could apply to medical school with uh, under any major as long as you've met the required courses that that they want. So you don't have to be only a biology or chemistry major to apply to medical school. So I believe that someone, uh, people should pick what they love and, uh, you know, you're paying for it. So you might as well enjoy what you're studying. Very good. Um, did you have any particular tricks? Would you use a lot of flashcards? Would you go to lecture 100% uh, of the time? Would you take notes while the professor was lecturing? Did you use other resources like YouTube or other paid resources? What did you find that worked for you? Um, so post uh, the pandemic, a lot of classes started to be recorded. And uh, I noticed that a lot of students stopped showing up. I maintained um, in-person classes, uh, going in-person to class. I found that to be the most effective. Um, out of the two, which is the other option to be just staying at home and watching the recording. I don't, it wasn't as fulfilling for me. And also um, going in person directly after class, the, uh, all professors give you the opportunity to ask follow-up questions on lecture. And so I would co consistently go up there, ask questions and gain clarification on what I needed to know. Other than that, I wasn't always a big fan of flashcards. Uh, what I would like to do instead was when I would form these study groups, we would ask each other questions, my colleagues and I. So instead of writing down flashcards, I loved to just communicate uh, with them. And it was always great because when I would get an answer wrong, they could explain it to me and give me their input as to why that was wrong and help me fix that. And so having another person in front of me giving me their own perspective, because we all learn differently. And I remember in a lot of classes, especially, um, I believe it was physics, there sometimes were multiple ways to kind of go about one problem. And so it was nice to have other people rather than just putting this answer down and reviewing that one way of solving that problem. It was nice to have someone else say, hey, there's another way how to do this and this way works better. And so that was one thing that I really did. Um, yeah. That's not very common. So it's almost like you were getting an oral exam. You know, they... You know, it's not very common in the United States, but in other countries, you know, they do sort of stand up oral exams as part of graduating from college. You need to sort of be put on the spot live in front of a professor and answer questions and you get graded. It's definitely not common in the U.S. because it's very time consuming and it, I just don't see how it would sort of fly here. So but other than that, so, you know, you're kind of. Um, you know, you're really busy with these exams. You're doing very well. What did you decide on, you know, the timing of your MCAT? Yeah. So during my junior year, I still, um, it was, I, I transferred into Davis and now I'm here and I'm kind of getting used to the way it is. It's different than community college. And so during that process, while I'm completing these major required courses, uh, I decide that my application needs to be strengthened prior to uh, applying. And I find it advantageous to dedicate set time post-graduation to study every day for the MCAT. The MCAT is a very, very difficult, rigorous exam that requires you to extensively study for it for a few months at least. 
So I did not think that it was wise for me to balance these upper division biology and chemistry courses and then study every day on top of that for the MCAT. Also, during my junior year, I still had, and even a little bit into my senior year, I had not completed all the uh, upper division courses that show up on the MCAT. And so I just found it best to take that gap year that I'm doing right now and uh, dedicate time to studying for arguably one of the most important exams that I'm, I'm going to be taking. So you feel like you'd better have more clarity of mind and carved out time rather than jam packing everything into into a clean package and have it all ready when you graduate. Definitely. It's definitely easier to balance, especially given that uh, as pre-medical, uh, as pre-medical students, we're not just studying all day. We're, we're looking into different experiences, such as shadowing, uh, being a scribe. And so there are, our days consist more of simple, uh, simply reading books and taking practice tests for our classes. So as you started to get into your, you know, fourth year, you had pretty much moved away from home for a good year did you get used to it at that point living away from you know your your base yeah i i did it definitely took some time uh i'm very family oriented and um it was difficult being so far away that first year but after a few months i kind of got in a rhythm i i learned where everything was in the city i made some great friends some great colleagues and Davis, in a way, started to kind of feel like home. It started to resemble home in a way. And so I quickly adapted to it. And give, and like you said, during my senior year, um, I was very comfortable there. I was comfortable there as both a student and as a resident of the city. Okay, very good. So um, how did you build some relationships with your professors who had become your letter writers while you were there? Would you try to attend their office hours or were you waiting to be in the really smaller upper division classes where getting to know them was sort of inevitable or was it through the TAs? I mean, how did you plan this out as these letters of record? Very important. I agree. Um, so I did this primarily through office hours. I think that is the, um, the way that a lot of students do so. And that's exactly what I did. During office hours for some of these classes, not all students show up. And so you do sometimes get these couple students in, in, an, in an office and you get to talk a lot with the professors. They're not always going over content. Sometimes, especially in the first week or two, when content uh, level is low, because we just started the quarter, a lot of professors wanted to get to know us. They wanted to get to know the students who they believe would be regularly attending these office hours. And so I would show up and I would introduce myself. I would tell them that I'm a pre-med student and just chat with them a little bit. And then over the weeks, I would consistently go to office hours, asking them questions based on, on the content uh, that we learned in class, but also getting to know them personally. And sometimes I would find a lot of overlap and in, in interests. It could be something as simple as um, a TV show that is currently popular and just so happens that we both watch it. And it kind of uh, gets them to know you a lot better. And so... I think attending office hours was the was the greatest thing uh, to get close with a professor, to really get to know them, and then inevitably for them to uh, write you a strong letter of recommendation once you uh, finish that course. Okay. How many visits would you say it took until they started to, you know, acknowledge you as a person rather than just, you know, a generic number or just another student? Would you say at least five or six? I would. So if, if the quarter is 11 weeks and three weeks into the quarter, let's say you go to office hours twice a week, about six times before you start, uh, they, they will about re remember your name and um, kind of know your face, remember something you said from the week prior and just kind of go off that into uh, another topic and yeah. So at this point, have you already asked all your letter writers to write a letter? Yes, I have. And I have uh, received uh, three of those letters uh, as well. Are any outstanding or you've only asked for three so far? Um, I've asked for three so far. And these are the three professors from my universities. And uh, I will be in the process of obtaining the other letters of recommendation in the following months. Okay. And just so other students are aware, you know, it does take time to get these letters. 
how long from your how long was each one would you say from the moment you asked until the letter was finally uploaded on average probably 4 months i would say i four i months. yes 4 months i gave my professors uh, a lot of time i told them there is no rush and this is why i started early because i did not want them to rush my letter and um, i would explain to them when i'm applying and that they can take their time and then they would set a date with me let's say four months into the future we would they would say reach back out to me a week or two prior just to remind me one more time but uh for two of them they had it done within uh half the time that they said that they would do it in yeah so the three that you asked um out of curiosity were there a few more that were sort of on your radar but you didn't feel as strongly about how many would you say you sort of had on your top list and then? Uh, I probably had about six. Six, okay. Uh, there were four uh, science professors that I was considering and two non-science professors. I kind of made a list and went down how much I've interacted with them. And um, starting in, in Davis, I actually kept a journal where I would write down what I would discuss with these professors. So I kind of referenced my journal and saw that for maybe one of them, I had a lot more one-on-one -on -one time. And uh, I kind of based it off of what I wrote down, what I remembered, which I believed, which professors I believed uh, interacted with me the most and knew me the best and could speak highly of me. And so that's kind of how I uh, filtered it out to the three that I uh, ended up asking. So, as you know, for, I think for the audience that's listening, you can tell from Chris's experience that it's quite a bit of dedication, you know, to have to go to office hours and be persistent. And, you know, perhaps that week you understood the material pretty well, but, you know, you should still go. It can still open up your mind. You can learn new things. It really shows that you're committed. So out of curiosity on some of these office hour visits, would it just be maybe you and 10 other people that were sort of the more consistent ones or even a smaller group at that point? I believe it was even smaller. As smaller. far as consistent um, goers went, it was maybe five or less. Five or less. Uh, they office hours would get uh, particularly packed uh, about uh, a week before exams. A lot more students would come in to clarify concepts before an exam and then always after an exam especially the week the office hours directly after an exam almost nobody would be there a lot of the times the professors would consider canceling but um because not a lot of people show up those are great opportunities to go there and clarify some concepts and have them get to know you a little bit better okay so you know a couple of things that are a little unique about Davis compared to say, for example, um, UCLA, where a lot of students go is, you know, the proximity of their medical center to the undergraduate campus. Um, what were some of the volunteering and research opportunities like there? Because, you know, at UCLA, for example, you know, the, you know, the hospital is essentially attached to the undergrad campus, you know, USC, for example, is different. The USC hospital, LA County hospital is not attached to the undergrad campus. So um, any thoughts on that? There, Something to keep in mind? Yeah, there were some programs. Um, I discovered them a little late into my time there in Davis. I think the reason that happened was because I was so focused on um, getting used to the, the, the life of being there and taking upper division courses, kind of geared away from um, shadowing and volunteering for a while. When I ended up considering doing it, there were applications that you would submit for the following quarter. I remember one was a uh, volunteering opportunity at the hospital local uh, to Davis, and it was um, shadowing. And you had to submit an application. You would have to write uh, a few essays about yourself. I'm not sure if I ended up submitting it, but uh, as far as research goes, though, Davis is really well known for research. I did not particularly do any research in a laboratory or anything there. But uh, my first year there, my roommate was also a transfer from a local community college to Davis. In his first week, he walked into a professor's uh, office who has a chemistry lab, and he just kind of uh, explained a little bit about himself. And the professor let him into his lab for the, uh, just by, you know, chance or whatever it is. So yeah, I think the opportunities are there. You just have to really go out there and 
and get it. The opportunities for research will not come to you. They're not easy to obtain by any means. You really have to showcase to the professor why you deserve that opportunity to do research with them. Okay, very good. Anything you would have done differently, um, you know, either at PCC or Davis? I would have looked over the requirements to apply to medical school much earlier than I did. I went about it my first two-ish years, not really knowing too much besides, hey, you have to take these classes and whatnot. I didn't realize the importance of uh, letters of recommendation until my final year at PCC and then uh, my first year uh, transferring to, to UC Davis. So I would have probably attempted to get a lot closer to some professors here at, uh, at, at Pasadena City College. And then other than that, I think I would have probably, if I had everything a lot more set as in I knew where I was going exactly, because keep in mind, as a transfer, you apply to these universities, but nothing's a guarantee. So if I knew exactly where I was going and what classes I had to take, even a couple months prior to finishing up PCC, I would have definitely made a plan, a, a, a two-year plan that maybe I could have taken the MCAT during my senior year. Although in hindsight, I'm really appreciative of the way it ended up. But yeah, you can always do better when you when, when, when you look back. Um, yeah. Good. So as we wrap up the interview now, um, any parting world, pearls of wisdom for, you know, some of the high school kids entering undergrad or those sort of in the mix right now? Um, everything we touched upon, you know, transferring from a community college, um, you know, life living away from from home obtaining letters of rec, you know, getting stellar grades, any of those you can touch up on? Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I definitely want to emphasize is although letters, although obtaining, although going to office hours to event, you know, to get close with professors and obtain letters of recommendation is important. It's also great to be there, review the content and get these high grades. Cause at the end of the day, we're all, we all want A's in our classes, of course. And so that's very important. I, I always emphasize office hours. Think about it like this. I, uh, there are 200 students in the class, for example, and only 10 of them are showing up. So I'm really trying to emphasize students go to that. Beyond that, um, even as early as your sophomore year, start taking a look at the application. What does it require? Did you know that you need three letters of recommendation? Did you know that some medical schools require you to take maybe an anatomy course. Maybe you can fit that into your schedule during your undergraduate courses. Look at specific requirements of uh, medical schools that you wanna apply to. They can vary. And post-graduation, you don't wanna have to, well, it's not the worst thing, but you, you might not wanna go back to a community college and complete one prerequisite course or another one. You know, you definitely wanna dedicate your time post-graduation to uh, obtaining experiences, maybe clinical hours and whatnot. So take a look at the schools you want to apply to. Each school has different requirements and make sure that you fulfill those requirements prior to graduating from your four-year institution. Um, other than that, uh, I do want to emphasize, once again, tutoring. It's very important. Group work is great, but uh, if your university offers free tutoring, utilize those resources. Universities offer a lot of resources to undergraduate students to succeed in these courses. Sometimes the professors can be a bit difficult. That's out of your control. But what's in your control as a student is finding where these resources are and utilizing them to the best that you can to end up succeeding in these courses. Absolutely. Well, Christian, we really appreciate your time, a lot of wisdom. And I think for the audience that listen, you know, really pay attention to these strategies one, especially if you're um, transferring from a community college to a university. Um, second, you know, be on the lookout for whether it's tutoring or office hour opportunities with the TA. You know, take every advantage you can take because you know what, bringing your score from even an A minus to an A makes a big difference on your GPA count. You know, 
Other than that, um, let me look at the time Christian put into getting to know all these professors. He had to go to every hour, one to two office hours a week for 10 weeks for six different classes. That might seem like a lot of commitment for students, or perhaps they don't think they need it. They're too smart or they're shy. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's the price you have to pay for not only getting engaged and, you know, statistically being able to get the letter. Um, there's a chance that you may only go to three professors office hours inconsistently and you may walk out with one letter of rec and you don't even know the quality of it so you really do need to take full ownership of your class so very good christian we really appreciate your time and we wish you luck and um last but not least um again we're just very proud of our armenian youth you know your parents have been through a lot you're here you're the new generation and you know you're going to make all of us proud in a few years thank you very good all right